Um, okay, so hello everyone. Um, good to see you all. Uh, so today we have uh, our discussion hour given by Ivan Strauma. So Ivan is a Jackson School postdoc with the Plates 4D initiative. He's working on Cenozoic paleogeographic reconstructions and paleoclimate modeling. He has a BSc in geophysics, which he got in 2014, and an MSc in geodynamics, which he got in 2016, both from the University of Oslo. He does PhD at the at SEED, which is the Center for Earth Evolution and Dynamics at the University of Oslo, which he got in 2020. And for this, he collaborated with the Bjergner Center for Climate Research in Bergen, where he focused on the paleogeographic evolution of Northeast Atlantic Ocean and its impact on ocean circulation and climate during the Cenozoic. After the PhD, he worked as a researcher at SEED before starting the postdoc here in Austin in 2021. He enjoys long walks on the beach and writing about himself in the third person. <laughs> so yeah, take it away. Yeah, thank you for this nice introduction. It's uh, almost like I uh, wrote it myself. Um, okay, so um, I'm uh, going to talk about the Cenozoic Oceanic Gateways to the Arctic Ocean. And uh, yeah, especially now since we're uh, not so many on Zoom and here you feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask questions along the way and I'll um, and I'll treat it as a discussion now or however that's uh, that's supposed to be so um, this is a uh, is a figure of the Arctic Ocean uh, at the present uh, day and uh, crudely sketched uh, ocean circulation um, and uh, today the uh, Arctic Ocean is connected to the rest of the world's ocean through the Bering Strait, uh, Arctic uh, Pacific Connection, and the Atlant Atlantic Arctic Oceanic uh, Gateways, which uh, is the only uh, deep water connection to the Arctic Ocean uh, today. And there's also the nor Northwest Passage or uh, <clears throat> Norris Strait, which uh, is through the uh, let me just see if I can, yeah, through the uh, Canadian uh, archipelago. And um, if we look at the uh, bathymetry, the, uh, yeah, you can uh, clearly see that the, the only <clears throat> deep connection is through the Greenland Scotland Ridge here and, uh, and the Fram Strait. Um, and there was also a connection to the Barents Sea, which is part of this Atlantic Arctic um, uh, connection. And this region is uh, today very important for uh, regional and global uh, ocean circulation as uh, it's uh, deep water formed in the in the northeast Atlantic uh, is an important part of the Atlantic meridional, meridional overturning circulation, which is important for a uh, global northward uh, heat transport. Um, and through the Cenozoic, which covers the last uh, 66 million years, the uh, Atlantic Arctic uh, Oceanic Gateways has uh, has been important for, for global, uh, global ocean, or could have been important for global ocean circulation through this time. The Bering Strait and the, the Nara Strait uh, were closed for much of this time. The Bering Strait probably closed around five, five million years ago. And, uh, the uh, Northwest Passage is uh, less well known, but uh, was most likely uh, close for most of the Cenozoic. However, if we go back in time, there was another possible connection to the Arctic Ocean, which was the West Siberian Seaway. Uh, and the Atlantic Arctic Oceanic Gateways and the West Siberian Seaways uh, is the, uh, are the, the ones I'm going to focus on mostly during, uh, during this talk. So the um, Atlantic Arctic uh, gateways uh, consists of the Greenland Scotland Ridge, uh, the Fram Strait, and, and or the Barents Sea. And um, there was a shallow connection in this region, or this is possibility for a shallow connection already from mid Eocene times. Uh, Seafloor spreading between Greenland and uh, Eurasia started around 55 million years ago. But in the beginning, the Greenland Scotland Ridge was uh, Sibero. Um, so there were no, and also it was probably closed in the Fram Strait uh, region uh, as well. 
and a type of modern day deep ocean connection were only possible after a front strait uh, deep in around 17 uh, million years ago. Um, and this region has been influenced by uh, dynamic topography through uh, the Iceland mantle plume, which has, um, uh, together with the high crustal thickness on the Greenland Scotland Ridge, makes this as, uh, an anomalously shallow region uh, compared to normal oceanic uh, lithosphere. And if you look at the uh, this reconstruction here from our paper from 2020 and the profile for the Greenland Scotland Ridge, um you can see this uh up and down motion which is not something you would expect from uh, normal thermal subsidence of uh, oceanic lithosphere and it's because we incorporated the model of the iceland plume which um, which caused this pulsation and this up and down motion of the ridge has been linked to uh changes in ocean circulation through the cenozoic um the West Siberian Seaway is, is less well uh, known, and uh, it was likely an open passage sometime in the early mid Eocene, around 50 MA. And uh, the depth and uh, longevity of the seaway is, uh, is very uncertain. And it's also uh, challenging to constrain whether or not it was uh, connecting to the rest of the world's oceans through the Tethys Seaway, um, which had to be open at the time for that connection to exist. Um, and there are uh, ge geological indicators of an open passage and uh, an interesting uh, more or less conclusion of this talk uh, is that uh, they correlate with uh, with uh, negative anomalies, uh, anomalies in dynamic topography. So this was sort of an introduction and also kind of a conclusion, um, but uh, I'm going to go a little bit more in, in depth of these things. Um, I'm going to start with uh, why we or why I care about these things, and, and, and uh, especially uh, that's because the evolution of these seaways could have been very important for uh, the climate evolution the last uh, 66 million years. That's the Cenozoic time, which, uh, yeah, as I said, covers uh, the last 66 million years from roughly about when the dinosaurs became extinct and uh, the present day. And uh, during this time, the climate has gone from a warm uh, greenhouse climate with uh, um, uh, more or less no, uh, no permanent uh, glaciations either on the Antarctic or Northern Hemisphere to uh, this cold ice house climate, which we're in today with polar glaciations and uh, steep pole to equator uh, temperature gradients. And uh, this is mostly due to decrease in CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, however, paleogeography and uh, the evolution of oceanic gateways, which I'm folks on uh, could have played a, a role for uh, for general trend but uh, and also the uh, the uh, 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 shorter variations in um, uh, in climate so i'm going to start by focusing uh, on a study we published earlier this year on the eocene legacy transition which is uh, uh, over a, a short period of time, the uh, climate cooled and you have the uh, major uh, ice growth on, on Antarctica or uh, the initiation of uh, maybe the initiation of the first permanent Antarctic ice sheets uh, at this time. Um, and uh, generally, uh, during this time, the paleogeography uh, changed due to uh, plate tectonic motions and, and other uh, things and this generally has an effect on ocean circulation and climate of course but I'm going to focus on these seaways or uh, passages connecting the, the major oceans and uh, uh, these may be uh, particularly important because um, uh, they can drive large-scale uh, changes in in, um, in ocean circulation, and then presumably also also climate. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, 
uh, Atlantic Arctic uh, gateways are one of the important uh, gateway events during this time, uh, which could have influenced the uh, overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there's the closure of the Tetis Seaway and the Central American Seaway, which uh, uh, ended this circum equatorial connection of the world's oceans. And maybe the most, most famous gateways are the uh, Tasman uh, Gateway and Drake Passage, which um, over time opened and <clears throat> facilitated uh, um, or enabled the uh, Antarctic circumpolar current, which uh, previously has been linked to uh, uh, the appearance of the first Antarctic glaciations. However, that's been more uh, debated uh, recently. So um, I'm going to show a study now on the Eocene, Oligocene transition, where we test the different, uh, different configurations of the different oceanic uh, gateways. So we took uh, the 34 MA paleogeography of this model I, uh, I showed you and, and change the elevation uh, in key regions of the uh, from Strait region, the Greenland Scotland Ridge, the Tetis Seaway, Drake, and Tasman um, uh, Gateway. And uh, we implement this paleogeography in uh, our system model. Um, and uh, we run this with. Uh, uh, three times pre-industrial CO2 level, which is um, somewhat was expected at that time, and run the different cases with different gateway depths. Um, and uh, we have a control run that's uh, our most likely scenario for the for the late Eocene uh, state of the oceanic gateways. Um, and this uh, control run produce uh, a climate with uh, annual mean temperatures above freezing almost uh, everywhere. We have a, we have a weak pole to equator gradient. There's a saline uh, Atlantic and fresh Pacific Ocean and a very fresh Arctic Ocean, which is um, important in this uh, study. And there's uh, uh, no overturning circulation in the Pacific Ocean. There is an Atlantic overturning circulation, um, and there's uh, no uh, Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, and uh, compared to temperature proxies for the time, we um, uh, you can see the uh, the temperature proxies, which are the square green ones. They fall somewhere in between our uh, annual and, and summer uh, temperatures. However, uh, there was uh, probably uh, even hotter in the uh, so southern and uh, northern regions uh, than, than we uh, have in this model, but they're, they fall somewhat in line. And we also run this with reduced CO2, which is the blue line here, and we get colder uh, polar, uh, polar regions, which is, uh, which is expected. And so, yeah, what happens when we change the gateway uh, configuration? So we started by opening the Southern Ocean gateways within realistic values of what is expected from our model of this uh, gateway. So uh, they're not as open as today, but uh, still like um, 1,000, uh, 1,500 meters uh, deep. Um, this uh, causes slight cooling along the coast of Antarctica, but has little effect uh, elsewhere. Um, and um, so it didn't really matter for uh, for our model uh, model surface temperatures. Uh, opening the north, uh, opening the Greenland Scotland Ridge while there's a, a close connection to the Arctic Ocean doesn't really matter either. You get a slightly warmer. Uh, Northeast Atlantic, but that's um, that's very regional uh, effects. However, if we open the Greenland Scotland or deepen the Greenland Scotland Ridge while the Fram Strait is uh, shallow but open, um, we get a huge temperature response of a cooling of the northern uh, hemisphere and warming of uh, the southern hemisphere. And the same if we uh, open both the Atlantic Arctic Oceanic Gateways and the Southern uh, Ocean Gateways. It, uh, we see the same result and it doesn't really 
the Southern Ocean Gateway has has a much less effect in uh, on our model than uh, than the Atlantic Arctic uh, gateways. Um, so the reason for this is that uh, when we open the uh, Atlantic Arctic gateways, we get this fresh water leakage from the Arctic Ocean into the North Atlantic, where it inhibits deep water formation in the Nordic uh, or south of the Greenland Scotland Ridge, which uh, basically shuts down the overturning circulation that was in the control simulation. And this um, uh, and, and this again changes the um, uh, northward heat transport and, uh, and changes the surface uh, temperatures. So what we uh, propose in relation to the Eocene uh, Oligocene transition in this study is that uh, prior to the uh, to the EOT there was um, um, there was an increase dynamic support from the Iceland mantle plume, which uh, shelled the uh, Greenland Scotland Ridge and, uh, and uh, caused uh, um, a warming of the, or a, a cool uh, uh, warming of the Northern Hemisphere and cooling of the Southern Hemisphere. Well, prior, uh, after the OT, this opened and uh, caused the cooling of the Northern Hemisphere and warming of the Southern. And when we combine this effect with decreasing CO2 uh, at the time, you don't really get uh, uh, the warming, but um, you get a situation where the, um, uh, where the southern hemisphere cools slightly before the northern hemisphere, which is uh, is observed in uh, in proxy uh, data. However, this is um, uh, the timing of such is uh, you know has uncertainties. Um, but um, the major point here is, uh, is, is maybe that this uh, could potentially have a very large uh, effect on, uh, on ocean circulation and climate, even, even a small connection to the Arctic, uh, if it's fresh. So to summarize uh, that, uh, or that study, the uh, opening of the Northeast Atlantic and changes in dynamic topography um, uh, could impact the Eocene, Oligocene global climate if there was a shallow connection to the Arctic uh, Ocean. And uh, freshwater leakage from the Arctic inhibits deep water formation in the North Atlantic and cause the proto overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean to, to collapse in our simulations. And um, these changes along with decreasing atmospheric CO2 could explain the observed climatic changes across the Eocene, uh, or the Eocene transition. Um, so uh, for this mechanism to uh, to happen uh, at the Eocene Oligocene transition, the Arctic needs to be uh, isolated from uh, from the other oceans. So to get the, the the fresh Arctic. So if say the West Siberian Seaway was open at this time, this wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, happen. Um, so uh, recently, uh, together with with colleagues here in, in Austin, we've been been working on the paleogeographic reconstructions on the the closure of the Teti Seaway and the topography of uh, Eurasia and um, Arabia, and looking at when this uh, connection between the Indo-Pacific uh, Ocean and the Atlantic through this seaway closed, and also um, how this might affect the other, other things than ocean circulation, such as um, uh, marine animal diversification and mammal migration. Um, and uh, kind of looking at this whole picture of uh, how both uh, deep earth processes such as mantle convection uh, through dynamic topography influence the topography and also uh, the uh, the global uh, global climate so um uh, we started this uh, by uh, digitizing geological maps or uh, trying to make uh, 
uh, digital elevation models for um, uh, based on uh, geological evidence of green, uh, of Eurasia and and Arabia. Uh, so we started by digitizing these uh, Darius maps um, for for different times. For this is for Eurasia, and here you can see the uh, based on. Uh, this geological compilation, there are a uh, shallow seaway through uh, Eurasia at, uh, uh, in, in the Eocene. Um, and uh, uh, we also did this for Arabia to look at the Arabia, uh, Eurasia closure. And um, these maps are for different geological times with uh, some spacing in between and in order to make a, a continuous digital elevation model for, for the um, Cenozoic uh, time, um, I applied the, uh, just a, a linear interpolation between the different times. So if I have a map for say uh, 20 MA and one for 30, then uh, uh, it will gradually change between the two to make a continuous model. So it's not necessarily uh, right, but it, it could have changed in a, you know, in a different way, but it um, um, at, at least makes an estimation of how the topography uh, is in between the, the times we have, we have data. And this is linked to a uh, plate kinematic model, in this case, uh, Torsvik and others 2019. Uh, model to uh, uh, and then incorporated in our um, uh, global paleogeography model from from uh, 2020 to get like a um, update the uh, the Tethys region and uh, and Eurasia uh, to also look at the, the West Siberian uh, Seaway and. Um, we want to look at this in relation to uh, dynamic topography <laughs> and together with uh, with Torsten, Torsten Becker and Bernard Steinberger, we've um, taken different topography models and, uh, uh, and plate kinematic models to make a, a paleo uh, dynamic topography model for, uh, for the Senozoic. And uh, the one to the left here is from the uh, TX2019 uh, slab, and the one to the right is from SMEIN2. Uh, and on the bottom here, I've plotted the difference between the present day dynamic topography and the calculated paleo dynamic topography for, uh, but the, the present day you rotated, so it coincides with the. Uh, uh, past location of the um, um, of the dynamic topography at the time, and in between uh, this is only for the continents in between Arizona the uh, the oceanic lithospheric age, which is uh, uh, which is used in the paleo uh, geography model to calculate uh, bathymetry. Um, and from yeah, can I ask a refresher question? Yeah, what is negatives in dynamic topography mean like the so the negatives in the lower uh, like the the different from present day negative that means that it was lower at that location uh, back in time than it is today um so um uh or uh, and that's uh, actually leads me to my next uh, next slide i think because the maybe the most interesting results from this in relation to topography is that we have this uh, negative anomaly back in time over uh, eurasia in the uh, smin2 uh, model and that uh, very nicely coincide with where the uh, West Siberian Seaway uh, is supposed to uh, uh, supposed to have been, according to um, uh, whatever geological uh, evidence or and sedimentary data, etc. for uh, for that region. So the error in the dynamic topography models are kind of it's they're fairly large, and there it's the further you go back in time, the 
the less accurate uh, they become. So you can't uh, you know, uh, be 100% uh, sure of the exact uh, nature of the dynamic topography back in time. However, like the general features such as this, where you have a, uh, this C-way uh, coinciding with this negative dynamic topography might be an, a, an explanation or a reason for why this C-way uh, existed uh, at that point in uh, time. Because there's no, you know, um, uh, major tectonic events and sea level changes uh, are not enough to to open the the, the seaway through, or uh, the West Siberian uh, seaway. So uh, changes in dynamic topography might explain why this um, uh, this seaway opened for for some time in uh, in the Eocene. And uh, yeah, around the Eocene legacy in transition, it's not a continuous connection in uh, in this paleo uh, geography model. However, in so the paleo geography is in the back here, just white is uh, above zero meters, and uh, the black is C. Um, we don't have a continuous connection at thirty four MA. Uh, there is. A continuous connection at 45. Uh, and I've shaded here the like from the literature potential time window for when this seaway could have uh, existed. And it probably didn't exist throughout this time, most likely just for maybe a few million years. And exactly when uh, it's hard to pinpoint from, from this model, but it seems like at least this connection to the Arctic was uh, possible for. Uh, uh, for a period of time from um, uh, maybe 45 to uh, to 55. However, for this thing to to matter for the larger or uh, for this to actually connect to the Tethys Seaway and the uh, Atlantic Ocean, it needs to have a, a way to you know flow into the Tethys and. Uh, in in this model from 37, uh, roughly, it's a possible uh, connection to both to the Arctic and through the Tethys, and maybe even here through the uh, uh, into the north um, or into Bay of Botnia. I guess that will be in um, and uh, 45. It's uh, uh, we have a possible connection here as well and from 45 to 55 there is continuous open uh, open connections uh, before before this one uh, closes however it's very shallow and it's uh, for our simulations of the from straight the uh, change or the difference between a closed and open from straight was 20 meters deep and 140 meters deep so uh, and this one is is generally um, shallower than 150 meters so it's um, uh, it's it's hard to say whether or not it mattered and um, for uh, uh, if it actually um, uh, was a connection uh, at all. Uh, however, if there, it doesn't need to be very big to actually matter. So, um, so it could potentially be uh, uh, be important. And there are for, for sure uh, indications of this being closed in around 50 MA when you had this solar phase uh, in the Arctic, which indicates like a um uh fresh water conditions in the in the arctic uh, ocean so to summarize uh yeah both uh seaways could have uh, provided shallow connections to the arctic ocean in the uh, eocene um the evolution of these seaways uh, significantly influenced the strength of the proto-atlantic meridional overturning circulation and could have played a key role in the sensoic greenhouse to ice house transition uh, maybe uh, like a bold statement, but at least in models. Um, and uh, the paleo geography of both both seaways were affected by changes in in dynamic topography to a degree where it could have made a difference for regional and and uh, global climate because they either or only changes in like a few hundred meters seems to have an effect uh, on uh, on these models and. Um, 
it's not just uh, our study from um, uh, from this year. There's also a uh, few or two papers by Hershitz and others which model the same effect on uh, only they have a passage to the bar and uh, C rather than the from straight, which might be more more likely but it's yeah it doesn't really matter but it's um it seems uh, that if you have this fresh arctic ocean it uh it's uh, it can have a huge effect on um, on ocean circulation if you open that passage so that's it thank you for uh, for listening oh thank you very much thank you um yeah do we have any questions online or in the room for Ivan? are people still online <laughs> um i guess i can start with a question so how do you like get the dynamic topography back in time based on a tomography model because one model just shows like now so yeah so this is uh, is bernard uh, uh bernard sandberger's uh, models uh, which uh, i think he's been uh, doing that for for some time but it's uh, it's based, you have the, the tomography and the uh, plate kinematic uh, model and you use that to uh, I think backward effect uh, okay. stuff into the um, uh, mantle and of course it's very uncertain when you <laughs> when things are going up and disappearing and you have to you know make it go back in uh, and uh, you know the further you go back in time the more um uh more uncertain uh it is but i think that's the general uh general approach so um i'm um uh, yeah exactly how his uh, uh how his models uh yeah, deal with all these different things i'm not sure but the overall general uh, approach is at least uh, that so it's like the opposite of like a Giordano model that yeah. 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 Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, the, if you uh, like the the signal become weaker uh, the further you go back in uh, time as well, so the differences I show become like automatically uh, stronger back in time uh as well so uh the uh from the tomography models for example for the west siberian seaway it seems like there is some dynamic support underneath there at the moment uh which makes this um uh, if there's a I don't know, hidden uh, mantle plume or uh that's so something that uh, uh when you go back in time it becomes negative and the exact timing of when this negative uh, dynamic topography happens is uh, is not sure, but it's more that if you have something underneath there now that makes it more uh, or makes a higher dynamic topography, it's you don't need much of a change in that to uh, facilitate the sea way in the, um, in the region. And we, I don't think we really can use that model to say like it was high at 45 and not at 35 million years ago for example it's more like it was lower at that time most likely because it's uh or it's prone to changes in that region just like yeah, small changes in dynamic topography could make a difference in in um, in the topography it was cool that you could show that the freshwater injection in the arctic messes up with the whole Circumpolar things. That's like yeah. one of the big global warming things, right? Is the ice in the Arctic melts yeah. and you end up with much more fresh water. Yeah, I think people have uh, used this or seen similar things for um, uh, for uh, modeling also paleoclimate, but more, much more recent for um, uh, last glacial maximum, uh, for example. We also can have this, uh, and also for. For, for the present day, but it 
now it's a more like uh, yeah more much more linked uh, system than uh, and a much more open connection to the Arctic than at so the, the, it would it's I think much more extreme in in my um, or in our uh, models for uh, for the EOC where it's completely uh, locked and very fresh um, and opening this uh, small gap just you know uh, leaks this fresh water into uh, a lot of it, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, the uh, talk about this for the both present ice melting from Greenland and uh, sea ice and the um, uh, the uh, last glacial um, times. Uh, Cornell, do you have a question? Or... Yes, yes. Thank you, Ivan, for the talk. Hi. Thank you. Didn't see you in a long time. You look good. Yeah, thank you. You do. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. But so the thing is, uh, so do you use geological observations to constrain or to, I mean, yeah. some of this uh, geo, I know, like dynamic uh, movements. Yeah, at least for the or the paleo topography uh, for I've, I've, uh, or uh, the dynamic uh, uh, motions in the uh, northeast Atlantic. Then we've uh, used the uh, or then we also looked at geological evidence for that, mm. but not for the West Siberian uh, Seaway. So for the West mm. Siberian uh, Seaway, it's not. Uh, or it's basically just these uh, geological maps from the Darius project that's been uh, that's uh, converted to um, uh, to elevation maps, and uh, they're uh, they're not as detailed as we could, or maybe one could see changes in dynamic topography, but it's very hard to know if that's actually uh actual or actual changes in uh dynamic topography or something else or if it's sea level changes or uh, uh i think it's it's better constrained in the in the north atlantic where you have a lot mm. of drill sites along uh the norwegian margin and the uh, uh we have uh, uk british uh, margin and also on uh or you have more data there i think too uh to at least uh, infer more about uh, the dynamic uh, yeah. components. I, yeah, I was thinking to put like geological observations with the range, just to see how much control you have on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, yeah. You, you know what you mean. I mean, it will give you a range probably. Any geological observations yeah. will give you a range that you can play with, modifying the. I mean, changing the model parameters. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to fit some of them because. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking also like paleo bathymetry and stuff. Yeah, it's a yeah, so wide for, range. Yeah, so for sure, like in in these things, uh, let me. Yeah, these things here. Uh, that's basically like uh, I don't really know the elevation here, other than that, like it's shallow marine, or if yeah. it's uh, above sea level, or if it's uh, ero erosion going on, so it must be a little bit yeah. higher, or if it's so like the the error margin here is is rather big, and I don't know exactly how uh, hmm. big, but uh, so for example, I you know just assign the value to shallow marine, which. Uh, like if it's uh, very shallow, it's I don't know, uh, 200 meters. If it's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, deeper, it's 500. And mm -hmm. if it's uh, marine, it's more than 2,000. Or like, so it's- uh, Yeah, 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 I know, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a wide range, yeah. I mean, just yeah. thinking if geology can put more constraints on that, so then you can- Yeah, yeah. Get, but it's more work probably, but- um, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the future, I mean, we, yeah. we'll yeah, discuss that a, a bit- Yeah, sure. A while, but we can- Think more. I'm I'm keen to how we can add more of these geological points. So then, that will provide constraints for for future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm still on that. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I didn't give up on that. I'm just advancing slow. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll talk yeah, more but, about. Uh, yeah, we'd, uh, that would be great. Yeah. And uh, I think it's uh, it's very interesting to um, uh, to compile more more of these things. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I get some constraints. I mean, good, good. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, you should present more often. So, <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for uh, for listening. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I will just.
close now. Yeah. Okay.